<laughs> uh, so yeah, we have uh, Charlie now from Charlie Arbor from the uh, Institute of Neurology, who is very kindly going to give us a talk on what's really going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everybody, and thank you for the invite. Um, yeah, my name's Charlie. I'm a bit of an imposter. I'm not really a modeler. Um, I use uh, cell models to try and understand what's going on in dementia. Um, as you can see in the background, um, I look at inflammation in stem cell derived astrocytes and stem cell derived microglia. And um, again, I'm not an immunologist, but I'll give you a, a bit of a literature review on uh, inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so an immunology talk for non-immunologists, a bit like Phil earlier. So we'll go with that. Do I need to click? Oh, sorry, the mouse wants and then you should have the keys. This there we go. go. Um, okay, so mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease. We've seen lots of this today, but uh, the simple point that I wanted to make was that the amyloid cascade hypothesis is around 30 years old. It works very well with familial forms of dementia, but there's clearly something missing, as we all, as we all probably appreciate. Um, the best evidence of which being that um, amyloid beta alone can't explain the disease. We, we now see that amyloid clearing drugs don't reverse the disease. And so either some, irre, irre, um, some one way damage has already happened or there's something else going on. And I'm, one of the points that I'd like to make today is that it's because it's been a very neurocentric view of Alzheimer's disease. We focused on neurons as the main functional cell in the brain and uh, inflammation clearly plays an important role in the disease process. Jack curved again, sorry. Um, <laughs> But just as a quick uh, plan for the talk, I'll talk about what inflammation is in AD and what, what it's specifically doing in Alzheimer's disease progression, um, and then try and understand exactly where that fits into the Jack curse progression. Can we build inflammation into the models to try and understand staging and mechanisms uh, in what's going on in dementia uh, mechanisms? Okay, so what's inflammation? We've heard a little bit about this from from so earlier, but um, I think it's really common to many neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases. By neurodegeneration, I think we really mean chronic inflammation. So but this is uh, in, in um, contrast to acute normal roles of the microglia and the, and the other cell types in the brain. Chronic inflammation can lead to glial cell hypertrophy. So more glial cells in the brain leading to gains of function in some, some respect. For example, uh, aberrant synaptic pruning, which can affect the, the, the neurons in the brain, eventually leading, leading to axonal degeneration and neurodegeneration over time. This chronic inflammation is characterized by the pro-inflammatory cytokines. For example, a few are listed down here, the interleukins, the tumor necrosis factors, interferons and chemokines. Um, and I put a few discussion points that we'll come back to at the end, but the first of which being, we still don't know if inflammation is a driver of disease or whether it's really a response to the pathology. So we don't really know whether it's playing a key part in the disease progression or whether it's response to some of the other disease mechanisms. Both? Both, could be. I'll come back to that in a slide. <laughs> um, just as an example of inflammation in Alzheimer's disease, this is a large meta-analysis, and you can see on the right a whole list of some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines with quite large effects sometimes, but quite significant effects as well. And just as one example, you can see interleukin-1 beta with a, with a forest plot showing some of the overall significance in, in Alzheimer's disease. The conclusions from this paper are that there's very much per higher peripheral concentrations of some of these factors, and I'd like to point out that this is um, probably more significant in peripheral uh, biofluids compared to CSF. It seems there's more significance in, in, the, 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 um, in the, the peripheral biofluids compared to CSF. Um, and that brings me to another point, which is obviously many of these cytokines are soluble. They, they, they aren't local. They can travel peripherally and lead to whole body effects. And so how much of this can we image in local inflammation compared to whole, whole body inflama inflammatory changes? Okay, so which cells are responsible for some of these changes? So most of the talk will be focused on the microglia. 
Uh, as we know, Michael Lira, uh, brain resident macrophages in charge of the innate immune response. And they have a range of cell states, which were classically called M1 and M2, but that seems to be um, far too simplistic. But in general terms, microglia tend to be surveillant or resting in the brain, and they can become activated or reactive. And this is in timescales of seconds and minutes, you know, 30 seconds can be enough for some of these responses. So very different to some of the timescales we've been talking about before. Some of these responses can be anti-inflammatory, as you can see in the top, pro-inflammatory, phagocytotic, and there's a whole spectrum of some of these cell responses. Some of them can be helpful in the disease process, some of them can be harmful. And it's some of this spectrum that we really need to try and disentangle if it was the spaghetti in, in this part of the session. As well as microglia, astrocytes play a key role, and we've heard a little bit about GFAP before, but also the endothelial cells having response in the blood-brain barrier, and then subsequent infiltrating blood cells, such as T cells, which can have quite a major impact in, in inflammation in the brain. One of the discussion points to come back to is, can we distinguish some of these cell states? Can we distinguish anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, different types of inflammatory responses? Okay, so what does neuroinflammation look like in Alzheimer's disease specifically? So I think some of the best clinical evidence is that uh, people living with dementia can have good days and bad days. And this is really linked to whole body inflammatory status. So for example, the classical um, piece of evidence for this is dehydration can lead to urinary tract infections, which can lead to inflammation and bad days, which is typified by these delirium type uh, clinical manifestations. I think COVID is another great example of this and people living with dementia were much harder hit. Some of the pandemic, not only isolation, but some of the responses to the, to the virus too. Pathologically, when we look post-mortem, obviously that might be too late for some of these dynamic responses, but what you can see in the images at the bottom, um, around the plaques, you can see on the left green, on the right blue, microglia stained by IBA1 in both sides um, and astrocytes stained by GFAP on both sides really cluster around the amyloid plaques. So these cells are very much responding to the pathology specific in Alzheimer's disease, um, obviously having an effect in the disease progression. Because of this um, response to the plaque pathology, you can see that the cells not only increase in number, but they change their distribution. And so maybe this is something that we'll be able to measure going forward, not only the number of microglia or astrocytes, but also how they move in space and time, responding to some of the amyloid pathology. Some of the strongest evidence for microglial involvement and inflammation in Alzheimer's disease is GWAS, so these genome-wide association studies. This is a bit outdated now, but one of the largest GWAS studies a few years ago. And I guess the point I wanted to make was that of these new risk factors uh, on the left-hand column, around half of them are enriched in microglial cells that you can see within the yellow box. So as well as these new uh, risk factors, many of the classical risk factors such as APOE, BIN1, CREM2, these are all very much microglial enriched. And it really seems that many of these risk factors are altering microglial function in some way and therefore having an effect on inflammation. The same is true for other dementias and neurodegenerative diseases such as FTD and Parkinson's. And when you look at C9072, granulin, GBA, these are all very much enriched in microglia. And so obviously we've been very focused in a neurocentric model of Alzheimer's disease, but we've sort of been forgetting that many of these genes are very much enriched in the immune compartment of the brain. Um, but yet we don't exactly know the effect of some of these risk factors. Are these having leading to hypersensitivity? Are the immune cells responding to lower levels of stimuli? Is it leading to chronic inflammation? Do they take it longer to bounce back to normal levels? And these are some of the questions that we still don't know. Okay, so Hopefully I've shown some of the um, evidence why microglia and inflammation are central to Alzheimer's disease. In the final sort of part of the talk, I'll hopefully give you some sort of current 
uh, state of the art into what microglia are actually doing, what's their function, how we can fit them in the jack curves, where the staging of inflammation seems to fit in, and also some of the modeling. Can we build these into the models in, in more complex ways? So microglia, what are they doing in Alzheimer's disease? And this is one of my favorite ideas is that when you deplete microglia from mouse models, for example, you actually very much affect some of the amyloid pathology. And what you can see is that in some of these studies, you deplete microglia or microglial function, such as TREM2 knockouts, or just simply killing off the uh, microglia with yes, F receptor inhibitors. And what you'll see is that the amyloid pathology changes to quite a large degree. It's much more diffuse, it's larger, and it seems to be more toxic to the surrounding brain cells. Um, this sort of tells us that microglia are having some beneficial role early in Alzheimer's disease, especially with amyloid pathology. Some normal function of microglia seems to be um, important for encapsulation, for example. It might be packing away the am amyloid into sort of safe compartments that lead to less damage to the surrounding tissue. And maybe it's some sort of loss of this healthy function of microglia in aging or in disease that triggers some further downstream um, disease events. So microglia are doing something good. It also seems that microglia could be doing something bad in different settings. So I, I, I quite like this piece of evidence that shows that microglia have some relation to selective vulnerabilities. So the different vulnerability of tissues in Alzheimer's disease. When you look at not only microglial density around the brain in different brain regions, when you actually look at their function and their transcriptional signatures as well, these are very different in different tissues. And this seems to link quite closely with the tissues that are more vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease to, to some of the toxic changes. This links to the expression profiles, but specifically energetic variations, which might affect how microglia respond differently to different cues but also microglia in different brain regions age in a different way, and they have different um, sensitivities to some of these immune reactions, and they have variations in some of their signatures um, shown in this paper. So they seem to be doing something good at one point, they seem to be doing, doing something involved in some of the disease progression in another way. And I think some of the biggest advances in our understanding of what they're doing, not only in context dependent ways, um, but what they're doing over time has been with the new technologies and single cell sequencing has given us a lot of information about what microglia um, look like through different disease progressions. I think the first paper that showed this, but there have been a number of since then, is the, is the Karen Shaw paper from 2017. And what you can do is you can look at, you can take out single uh, microglia from healthy and Alzheimer's disease brains and start to see, does the mouse work? Sort of, um, anyway. Um, you can start to see the emergence of these disease-associated disease signatures in disease, um, shown by the cartoon in the, in the red um, on the right. What this corresponds to is a specific gene signature, which is specific to the outside, the amyloid responding cells. Um, and this seems to um, relate to phagocytosis and endocytosis. So it seems to be a specific response to some of the plaque pathology. The same seems to be true in astrocytes as well. So there are disease associated astrocytes. Um, cluster four in the bottom right, I'm not sure if the colors come across too well, but in the healthy brain, you don't see cluster four, whereas in Alzheimer's disease and advanced aging, you get this specific signature in the astrocytes which again is upregulation of phagocytosis and endocytosis, um, suggesting specific glial responses, possibly linked to inflammation uh, in response to the pathology. Uh, I should mention importantly that the disease associated microglia, there's some overlap in humans compared to the mouse studies. It seems that there is a slightly different disease associated microglia in humans compared to mice. Um, but we can still pick out these specific subgroups of cells in humans. As well as single cell sequencing, we can look at spatial transcriptomics and try and understand the transcription um, signatures of glia 
in proximity to plaques as well as distal to plaques. Again, the microglia and astrocytes in close proximity to plaques seem to upregulate some of these phagocytosis type signatures, um, suggesting that um, it's a really a response to the amyloid that the microglia that they're showing us. Okay, next talking about some of the changes in microglia and, and how they relate to the stages. So it seems to be that they're responding to the amyloid pathology in Alzheimer's disease. Where can we fit them in the staging of the disease? TREM2 is one of the largest risk factors um, and soluble TREM2 is its shared version. So TREM2 is on, on the surface of microglia. When it's cleaved and shed, we can start to detect, detect soluble TREM2 in the CSF. Um, its normal role is in sensing uh, amyloid beta and uh, what's, what knockout studies were shown is that when you knock out TREM2, microglia don't properly migrate to plaques and there seems to be a problem in sensing A beta and amyloid plaques. What the graph um, shows you on the right is that, um, does the mouse, I try and, let me try and get the mouse working, uh, laser pointer. So we have healthy controls, um, CSF uh, soluble TREM2, and it seems to be relatively similar in Alzheimer's positive and tau negative patients, but we see quite a strong correlation once patients um, develop tau pathology, suggesting that TREM2 is linked in some way to tau pathology. Taking it further, uh, it seems to be um, linked to cognitive, it seems to be a protective marker as well, because patients that have higher levels of, sol of soluble TREM2 have slower cognitive decline. And so it seems to be this early, it's showing us an early response of the microglia in a protective, healthy way in some, in some manner. We can start to stage that. So the peak seems to happen prior to cognitive decline, but after A, beta and tau. Um, but then it also seems, it also drops after cognitive decline. So it, it, it's represented by this green peak here, suggesting that this might be some sort of protective response of the microglia. And um, what I'll show you next is that we can start to depict different signatures from other inflammatory cells, um, which seem to come up after cognitive decline. In the Swedish Biofinder study. So this is they've looked at a number of different biomarkers through time in Alzheimer's disease. They quite nicely depict this soluble TREM2 peak just in mild cognitive de in decline in some sort of early response to pathology. But we can see different inflammatory markers, YKL40 and GFAP, which seem to come up much later. So they seem to be quite different stages of inflammation, representing different functions of microglia and different responses to a disease progression. So I'll talk about YKL40 and GFAP. So YKL40 is a microglial marker, goes up when the microglia are activated. GFAP seems to be more astrocyte specific and again is a marker of reactivity and, ast and astrocyte um, activation. And you can see these do go up in Alzheimer's disease. YKL40 on the right has significant increase in, in CSF and GFAP seems to be more specific in plasma than CSF, but we can start to measure some of these changes um, after cognitive decline, suggesting that these might be signatures that are more representative of damaging inflammatory signatures. GFAP um, seems to be associated with amyloid PET. And when these authors um, did some nice association studies. So what you can do is start to do association studies between some of these um, fluid biomarkers and imaging studies. <laughs> and what they've done here is um, try to link together in the staging in a staging manner, these voxel wise associations between some of the plasma GFAP that I've, I've shown you just now with amyloid beta PET. And you can see quite nice correlations with inflammation and amyloid in cognitive unimpaired um, AB to positive uh, participants. What you can see here as well is when they use amyloid beta PET as a proxy for time, you can start to see some of these changes in these inflammatory markers, um, such that uh, GFAP in the plasma goes up 
as amyloid PET goes up. So this correlation between um, disease stage with A beta PET and inflammation with DFAP. And this links quite nicely with um, worsening in, in cognitive functions such as the MMSE. Imaging studies, there are a number of these association type markers where they've looked at um, plasma biomarkers, CSF biomarkers with uh, related uh, imaging studies. But as we heard, there is there's really only one direct imaging modality for inflammation. And that's some of these TSPO PET tracers. What TSPO is, is it's a microglial marker. It's, it's expressed in the mitochondria and it seems to go up with microglial information. These markers have been around for a couple of decades now. Um, there are second generations and, and new generations coming out, um, such as those listed here. And what you can see quite nicely on the right is that you can pick up some of this inflammation in the brain via TSPO PET imaging when you compare uh, healthy controls at the top, mild cognitive impairment and, and Alzheimer's disease at the bottom with this nice increase in TSPO PET label tracer signaling. However, there are a number of problems with TSPO as, a, as a, um, an imaging tracer. There's a specific variant that around 10% of um, African and Caucasian populations have, which lead to low signal naturally in some individuals. And so individuals need to be genotyped before having any TSPO um, type uh, imaging studies. Um, and the biology doesn't seem to be completely clear. And this is uh, just from a couple of weeks ago. So I thought I'd put it in, suggesting that um, what you can see in the bottom right is that in APP model mice, you see this huge increase in TSPO PET labeling, uh, which is specific to microglia and not in the astrocytes. However, when they looked in human models and postmortem tissue uh, from AD, you can see it, there's, there's not actually increasing signal in, in inflammatory type tissues. And this might actually be relating to TSPO labeling um, just all microglia. And so the increased signal that you might see from the studies over the last couple of decades is actually relating to cell numbers rather than um, uh, inflammatory status, for example. So it might actually be a proxy for glial cell hypertrophy rather than um, inflammatory status and glial cell activation. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can finish uh, one slide about functional co connectivity, um, where they've linked TSPO and functional connectivity, and quite nicely it shows um, a link between inflammation, uh, changes in functional connectivity, and direct association with cognitive performance. Um, and uh, I'll finish just with the conclusions. Um, inflammation is obviously important in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, biomarkers seem to enable staging, and there seems to be these two waves of inflammation, so possibly um, an anti-inflammatory helpful response and a damaging response later on. Um, and some of these imaging markers uh, uh, probably need a bit more work, and we can start to use some of those single cell technologies to help maybe develop some new traces that might be more specific to human cell states and pick up different states. Um, and I will leave up some discussion points that maybe we can we can come back to that. So um, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Charlie, that's great. Um, I think we've got time for just one burning question. So, Sorry for overrunning. <laughs> no more at all.
just to re repeat the question, I think it, it's that um, microglia, uh, the brain is immune privileged, and so why are microglia having su such a large role in Alzheimer's disease? Or, or is it just to explain the degree of the immune privilege? Delirium. Why, why I think microglia represent around five to 15% of all the cells in the brain. So it's actually quite a large number, I think. Um, I remember being taught that the, the brain was immune privileged and there's no real immune response in the brain. And I guess what they mean by that is the blood brain barrier is so, so tightly um, controlled in a healthy brain that uh, adaptive immune cells don't really enter into the brain and go in and out um, and migratory macrophages. But, the microglia represents an important innate immune um, cell that obviously is involved not only in patrolling for infections and immunity, but also have roles in development and things. And synaptic pruning has been shown. They have a big role in pruning the synapses and maturing the brain connectivity. So I think to soluble factors and things in the circulatory system, such as um, COVID and some of these long-term inflammatory statuses, I think can have a big role in general status of the cells in the brain. And I think it can be like a domino effect over time, um, leading to higher levels of inflammation over time. Does that make sense? Like, uh, sure, yeah. I just have a small one of the really asking. I was really asking because you said there's a very beginning of the job that the baby has a very early stage. And that seems like side effects of I just wonder if I think I think that I think the brain is respond, responding to global levels of inflammation and delirium can be a downstream effect of that I think is yeah Yes. Thanks uh, again, Charlie. I think, um, just want to point out quickly that the last slide that Charlie's left off here is really pertinent to this mechanistic modeling session. It seems to me this this question of is it seems to crop up again and again that sometimes a given substrate can be helpful, but then at other times it can be harmful. And I think that's where mechanistic modeling is really useful because it has the time component. Identify those mechanisms. I think if we can develop signals that can pick up different substrates, that would be missing at the moment.